Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. We are now at episode 60 of the Unexplained Horror Stories series. Today, to celebrate, I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true unexplained paranormal horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. Joining me today is my good friend, Jay Nightmares. If you're a fan of Japanese horror stories translated into English, definitely check out their channel. You can find the link to do so in the description down below. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories. Hi, Swamp Dweller. Before I start, I just want to say I have never experienced anything paranormal, so to speak, except for a few very strange, but very mild happenings. I have always struggled with insomnia, vivid detailed nightmares and anxiety, so it was no surprise to me when I woke up to another, very terrifying dream. Warning you, this may sound ridiculous, but again, all my dreams are very vivid and have detailed plot lines and dialogue. Some, from when I was very young, I still remember to this day. In this dream, my brother and I were walking along a very familiar path in the national park next to my house. For context, I live in Australia. We take walks in it almost every single day. One day we were home. Our mother came rushing in and told us we were in grave danger, going to be punished for stealing something that belonged to someone else. Again, I know it's ridiculous, but bear with me here. Afterward, I took a solo walk along that same path and saw what looked to be a brown-haired girl in a long, white mud-stained dress suddenly appear in front of me, blocking the path. She had no distinct features. I can remember, except for a very angry, judgmental expression. As usual, I woke up with a startle sometime around 6 a.m. and recounted the dream in my journal. That night, as per routine, I took my dog on a walk around 6.30 p.m. around my neighborhood, stopping at the gate at that very same path from my dream. Again, it had always been there, nothing new. Even when I was nearing, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and my whole body felt tense. But now I was shaking, and had this unshakable feeling that I shouldn't be there. Not to mention, my dog, who was usually calm and collected, was whining and pulling back on her lead. How stupid and irrational, I thought. How many times had I taken this path? How many times have we done this alone and with family? And I hadn't given it a second thought. But now my every sense was telling me to run as far as my legs could carry me. Now, I know this is cliche and very foolish, but I ignored this. All of it. I pulled my dog, though it took some effort, to get them through the gate and start walking. Immediately, another family rounded the corner and started walking towards us and stared, fixated as we passed each other. My dog was growling, but I didn't think much of it. We continued along the path, and by this time, the foreboding feeling had faded just a little bit. As we passed the meadow and into the trees, the strangest thing that's possibly ever happened to me occurred. It was like both the clouds and trees parted, revealing a massive ray of sunlight streaming down onto the path and all around us, illuminating everything in my sight. Now, this may not seem too strange, but remember this was around 7pm in July in Australia. The sun had gone down well about a half an hour ago. Not to mention, the sense of peace and reassurance I got when it happened, like everything was going to be alright. I cannot tell you any more about this experience, because there's nothing more to tell, except for the fact that I cannot get it out of my head. The next few stories are very brief. Throughout my life, I had many times where I've recognized something that happened during my day as something identical to a dream. I had the previous night. This can range from reading something in a newspaper, article, or meeting somebody new to walking down an unfamiliar street. One time was extremely creepy and left me scarred. I was at my grandmother's house playing some board game one night when I got that overwhelming, overpowering feeling that I've been here before. It was triggered by something that she had said. But how could this possibly be? She hadn't said anything remotely profound, and I had never played this game before. In fact, she had just bought it that day. 
It may not sound too bad, but the horrible feeling was just what set me off. I haven't gone back in weeks and kind of sort of feel bad for my grandma. If this makes it into a video, I hope whoever is listening enjoyed these stories and can provide a little bit of a logical explanation in the comments. Thanks again, Swamp Dweller, for your amazing content. Kind regards, Alex from Australia. Last winter, my girlfriend and I had a huge argument while we were driving home late night in the mountainside. She kicked me out of the car and left me there. I thought that she'd come back soon, but she didn't. And to top it off, I realized I left my phone in her car. It was the dead of night, not a single car passed by. So the only option I had was to walk home. I was so annoyed. As I knew where I was on the mountainside, I decided to use a shortcut instead of the road my girlfriend and I drove up on. The grass was long on this road, but I could tell that a car had driven down here recently. Some of the grass was flat. This shortcut probably doesn't get used so much, so I found it a bit strange. It was a hard walk. I was cold and frightened. I wanted to quit. It was horrible. It was late at night and the hillside was so dark, I couldn't really see where I was walking. Then I saw a light. A small family car was approaching. It was behind me. Its bright light shining past me. The car's headlights were warm on my back. Was it running out of gas? Well, whatever. For the time being I thought I'd at least ask to borrow their phone. I stepped into the middle of the grass road and called out, um, excuse me. I regretted this idea almost instantly. Without thought, I had plunged myself into potential danger. I had no idea who was in the car or what they were doing in the mountain woods so late at night. What's wrong? A woman's voice called out from the car. I explained the situation and I asked if I could borrow her phone. We're out of the service area, she replied very calmly. With that said, I decided that I wanted to get the hell away from her. Well, uh, I better get going then, I said while I turned to leave. Please help me. By saying these few words, it ensured my escape was impossible. Help me dig a hole. If you help me, just for a moment, after we're done, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. As she said this, her right hand was idly making scooping gestures above her head, as if to cover it. Swinging her hand in that pendulum style made me wonder if I were to refuse what might happen. I frantically dug a hole with the shovel she supplied. While I was digging, the woman watched and talked to me. I can't remember most of the conversation. Doesn't make any difference now. She seemed to like talking. She was asking me all kinds of questions about myself. I thought it would be a bad idea to give her the correct answers, so I just made them up as I went along. Finally, I finished digging the hole. She went to her car and brought back a bag. I thought I was about to see a corpse, but I was wrong. The bag was overflowing with hair. Too much hair for one person. Uh, are you a hairdresser? I asked nervously. There was no reply. Just silence. It was terrifying. She brought lots of items from the car and threw them into the hole that I had dug. There were children's toys, clothes, etc. The last item was a cooler. I was terrified that there might be something in there. A child. My heart started pounding in my chest. By the end of it all, I didn't know what to think. She gave me a ride home, as promised, and it was finished. I began to forget about the incident over time. But this year, I found a paper bag in front of my house. I looked inside, 
and it was full of hair. I remembered the incident on the mountain and wondered if this could be a coincidence. Surely, surely not. It had to be related. I decided to tell my good friend about the situation, and my story certainly sparked his curiosity. Well, let's go there and dig up what you two buried, he asked. To be honest, I want nothing to do with those bags of hair, I replied. But he said, why don't you just tell me where the place is then and I'll go do it myself. And he kept asking and talking about it at work, again and again. It got to the point where I ended up going with him. I didn't want to though, but I felt he shouldn't go alone. One day after work, we headed towards the mountains, and he decided to invite another work friend too. Us three drove up the mountain road. There was a chain sectioning off the grass road I had walked down, and my friend got out of the car and unhooked it. The grass had grown a lot since last year. It bent beneath the wheels of the car. It was like we were surfing. I couldn't quite remember where the hole was since it had overgrown now. I thought because of this my friends would just give up searching for the hole. Nope. So I thought I'd just say, oh, here's the hole, in the hope of us digging there, finding nothing, and then we would all go home and it would all be over. But then it occurred to me that anyone would be able to notice the difference between a place that had been dug up. The grass would obviously be shorter and the soil would probably be a different color too. Here it is, my friend said with glee. Park up, shine the headlights in this direction. Let's dig it up, fast, my friend shouted. I wanted to go home quickly, so I didn't protest. I just helped them. With us three men digging, we were able to unearth the things that the woman had thrown away quite quickly. When I helped her bury all that stuff from her car, it was dark and I couldn't see it very well. There were a lot more things than I could remember in the hole. And there was the thing I was the most worried about. The cooler box. My friend wrenched it open. Black water splashed out. My friend dropped it, and all the black water sloshed out into the grass. What the hell? my friend said. I was expecting a body, my friend's friend said. This isn't a novel, this is reality, I told him. We filled in the hole and went back down the mountain. On the way back, my friend suddenly started to scream and shout about his hand. He said it felt as if his hand was burning. When he opened the cooler, that black water splashed on his hand. We rushed him to the closest hospital. We got his hand examined, and the doctor told us that he had suffered a corrosive burn. He got treated for it, and we were all relieved. But in the end, I still don't have the answer of why those things were buried out there in the mountains. The mystery remains a mystery. Nothing was resolved. I guess that's the end of it. I hope so. Back in the fall of 1983, I was a sophomore in high school in Minneapolis. It was the time of year for homecoming. On a Friday night, I and my friend Michelle walked from her house to our high school homecoming football game. It was in the fall of the year and a cool, crisp night with a light fog forming. I'd like to add that we were not under the influence of any alcohol or anything at this point as our night had just gotten started and there would be plenty of parties after the game. We were both sober as we could be. There was a huge cemetery at least six blocks long and three blocks wide near our high school. The cemetery was used by many kids from our high school to cross through at night or sometimes even party in if they weren't caught by someone from the security building that was attached to the chapel and mausoleum. It was hard to get into the cemetery, but there were a few ways you could squeeze in. As soon as we got in, we walked deeper into the cemetery, onto the main road. There was some dim lighting in there and a glow coming from the streetlights on the outside that penetrated the light fog, but not much. It was pretty dark. Probably five minutes or so in, Michelle stopped in her tracks. This freaked me out right away. I said, what? She said, did you see that? I told her to knock it off or I'm walking back to the opening. I could see she wasn't joking though, and she said, 
I swear something is galloping by the fence on the other side. I told her that sometimes they have security dogs running through there, and since I worked with all kinds of dogs at a shelter, even aggressive ones, dogs didn't really freak me out. She told me dogs don't gallop, and it looked human, but I ignored her and said we should just keep walking. This really put the tension in the air because I could see she was freaked out. I told her to stop worrying and change the subject, and we picked up the pace. We both attempted to struggle for conversation as she continued to look around as if there was someone following us. Suddenly, off in the distance, I could see what she was talking about. Along the fence, and looking like it was coming to our direction, was something bigger than a dog, and smaller than a horse. It was on all fours as it galloped our way. I could see it had a human face, and what almost looked like a long blonde braid. Michelle began to scream and started to run. I grabbed her arm, pulling her back. Clearly, she went into flight mode, and I went into fight mode. If she ran, this thing would chase us. We weren't even halfway through the cemetery. This thing was coming up on us very fast. It was at a breakneck speed. I could feel my adrenaline pumping and my heart pounding. About 30 feet away from us, I could see it had the face of a woman. It looked like it had dried blood on its face. As it got closer, it smelled horrible, like it was the stench of rotten meat. I could see its nose looked broken with blood coming from it. It was running down its naked chest. It shot up onto two feet and started running towards us, arms out and cursing in a guttural demonic voice. It said it was going to tear our throats out and play in our blood. This was finally enough to make us both run as fast as we could towards a light that was probably on the security building. It seemed too far to make it without the thing tearing us apart first. We could hear it running behind us and hissing our names. Michelle. Mary. How did this thing know who we were? For a brief second, it entered my mind that it was a prank from someone at school. But it couldn't be. It was all too inhuman. We ran for what felt like an eternity when we realized that this thing was no longer chasing us. Both of us were heaving and gasping for air. We could hardly breathe. I felt like I was going to pass out. We stood there holding on to each other crying when all of a sudden we heard a clicking coming down the road. To our horror, off in the distance, coming towards us with the huge talons clicking against the pavement and a bloodied face, we saw the thing galloping towards us again. We turned and ran away and we were hoping that we would make it out the way we came in. We ran through the trees and past the tombstones into the fog with no way to know where we came in from at all. My mind was blocking everything out. All I could hear was heavy breathing and my heart pounding. I could no longer run and had to stop when I realized Michelle was gone. I screamed for her several times and heard nothing. I turned back and ran toward the light of the building. I could barely see it off in the distance, but I knew I was going the right way. Again, I froze as something hit my nostrils. A horrible stench. The same rotten meat smell. I turned to look at the road ahead and saw the creature with the blonde braids crouching down about ten feet away from me with blood all around it and a body in front of it ripped open at the abdomen. I washed in terror as this thing dug into the stomach with its talons and dug out the insides of what I now realized was Michelle. It looked at me with a chilling, evil glare as it licked the blood from its talons with a long, black-forked tongue. My legs went weak. I couldn't scream and I could hardly walk. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience and felt like I was dreaming. Survival mode kicked in and I was able to pick up my pace running towards the building. This had to be a nightmare. There is no way I just saw what I did. About a block away in the distance, I could see a couple of trucks. I knew I had to get there. It was my only option. As I ran across the wet grass towards the light fog, it began to lift. I finally made it to the building. Pounding on the door and screaming, I could see two men in there. One running towards the door as the man opened the door, I fell into his arms. I explained as much as I could as rationally as I could. The only thing they were concerned about was my friend who was missing. It was a few minutes before I was in one of their trucks as he used a light in his truck to scan the cemetery while I yelled out for Michelle. We must have driven down every road before we saw a woman walking towards the truck. It was Michelle, her arms wrapped around herself as if she was giving herself a hug, hunched over and walking in a catatonic state. 
As we got closer, he stopped the truck and we both jumped out and ran towards her. He got to her first, asking if she was okay. As soon as I got to her, from the headlights on the truck, I could see her face was tear-streaked with black marking down her face. Her eyes were blank and expressionless. She stared at me like she didn't know me. She would not talk, and by the time we got back to the building, she was insisting everything was okay. She didn't want an ambulance or the police called. We were both dropped off that evening at our houses since we both lived so close. It wasn't until about five days later she finally took my call. She told me she needed time to try and process what she had seen, along with the creature that was chasing us. She had been running only to realize I was gone and no longer was with her that night. She had seen me being ripped apart in the middle of the road, just like I had seen her. She remembers waking up after passing out, and that's when we found her at the cemetery. The security guards were pretty angry and yelled at us for being two young girls under the influence of mind-altering drugs out in the cemetery. But I and Michelle know the truth. We didn't even have a drop of alcohol before we left. The stress of what eventually put strain and an uncomfortable feeling on our friendship, and by our senior year, we were close no more. We would see each other in the halls and smile awkwardly, but that was about it. There were whispers of what happened that night and why we weren't friends anymore, but no one really knew all the horrifying and life-altering details that affected us that night. It's interesting and tragic how horrifying that night and that experience changed our friendship. Fast forward about 35 years later, we reconnected on Facebook and have talked extensively about that night. We still have no logical explanation, and neither of us have shared it with many other people over the years. But 35 years later, we both still get anxiety in cemeteries, even during the day. This happened in 2009, when I was fishing in the summer. It was an area with steep hills and cliff faces. It seemed like the place where locals wouldn't pass through, as it was a bit of a trek to get there. It is said that the river is home to big game fish, and it was really secluded. It was the weekend, and I imagined there to be a couple of other people there, but I was delighted to find that I was the only person pitched up on the lake. After setting up my tent, I cooked a little, and then went off to sleep in my sleeping bag. It was nighttime when I arrived, and I planned on getting an early start to fishing at daybreak. I was having a perfectly sound night of sleep, until I heard this horrible loud noise. It shocked me out of sleep. I opened my eyes immediately. I didn't know where I was for a second. I hate that feeling. I couldn't hear that strange sound anymore. But my tent was shaking. A quick glance at my watch told me it was 2am. I told myself in my half-asleep state to remain calm and composed. I thought, wow, maybe this is that sleep paralysis I've heard about. I considered that might be happening, or I was suffering from some sort of auditory hallucination. But this seemed too real. This was no sleep paralysis, I realized with a shudder. Another possibility crossed my mind. A rock fall. But I remember checking the cliff before I pitched up my tent. It wasn't all that rocky. The soil was hard and dry, too, since it was summer. But this wasn't an impossibility. I didn't think that it could be a human in the middle of the night outside my tent. That thought was too terrifying to consider in the dark alone, so I tried to think of other possibilities. Because I was working myself up a little and getting frightened, I knew I wouldn't be able to go back to sleep, so I turned on the light in my tent, which put me at ease a little bit, but I didn't feel like going outside the tent to check. I told myself not to worry, and soon it would be bright outside, and I'll be fishing. Just as I was calming myself down, I heard something outside. It was quiet for a moment, until I heard another sound. It sounded like someone wailing, moaning, groaning, whatever. I felt as if I was going to pass out from the fear. On the other hand, I was thinking, it's a bit lighter now. What if it's a person, and they need help or something? I was worried for whoever might be out there, so I decided to leave my tent. Just as I reached for the tent zip, the moaning got louder. I paused for a moment. Cold sweat teemed from my brow. I could see something outside, the other side of the tent. 
a dark, hulking shadow. Now I was certain that someone was out there. I grabbed my torch and my frying pan as a weapon, and I pulled the zipper down and decided to face whoever was messing with me. I leaned out and looked around. I scanned everywhere. There was no one around. I could see a fishing boat in the distance, but that was all. I couldn't see the owner of that shadow that darkened my tent. It was deathly silent. It was truly terrifying. I withdrew into the tent. If you think about it, the tent was illuminated by my torch from the inside, so I shouldn't really be able to see a shadow outside due to the light. It was absolutely unexplainable. I turned the radio on to calm myself. I was shivering in my tent, trying not to think about what had just happened. After a while, I listened to the DJ chatting in between tracks. I was slowly regaining some composure. The roof of the tent collapsed in. It hit the ground, accompanied with some horrendous sound. This time I knew it was no dream or hallucination. The roof of the tent was utterly destroyed. Moreover, it hurt me badly as it crashed in. I felt totally helpless, and I'm not ashamed to admit this. I broke down, and I just cried and cried. I vowed to go home without doing any fishing as soon as the sun came up. The moaning sound outside persisted. There was a new sound now. It sounded like something dragging across the ground, or crawling perhaps. I don't know why, but I turned the radio up to its maximum volume. When daybreak finally came, it was like seeing God or something. I was so relieved. The sun was up, and now I could see everything around me. I went out of the tent and looked around the area. There were beer cans, bottles, and flowers scattered around. I hurriedly folded up the remnants of my busted tent and stopped in my tracks when I realized that there was blood outside of the tent, as if someone had smeared it there. Above, on the cliffs, there was probably a road at some point. I wondered if there had been an accident there. Maybe someone had passed away in the area I set up camp, perhaps due to the nature of their death. They became that horrible thing that tormented me. I didn't know what else I could offer as an explanation. Or perhaps there was some sort of creature out there. But I don't know anything in nature that would do that. I didn't know what else to do, so I offered my remaining juice to whatever spirit might be around. I left it as an offering to ease their passing, and wished them happiness in the next life. I choose to believe that it was a spirit, because the reality of some people, or a person, out there, messing with me, in the dead of night, is too terrifying to consider. So a little backstory. I'm currently 21 and I've witnessed some strange occurrences since I was about 16 years old. This includes having a door slammed in my face while home alone, seeing orbs and apparitions, seeing objects move on their own, hearing people walking, etc. I'm the only person who experiences these things, and they continue to happen even when we move houses, which makes my family think there could be something attached to me. I've never really bought into it since most of what happened to me was when I was younger, and I discredit it as I've aged. However, in the past few weeks, some more strange things have started happening. For instance, there have been a few times there I have been sitting in my room, all by myself, completely still, and objects spontaneously fall off the shelves on their own. And despite how hard I try to disprove it, by shaking the shelves, jumping on the floor, etc., I cannot replicate it. About a week ago, I was helping my girlfriend feed a family friend's cat, and I saw something. I was looking through the doorway, when a pure white cloth floated from left to right and disappeared right in front of me. It had visible wrinkles in it, and was slightly translucent. I immediately told my girlfriend, but we disregarded it, thinking I was just seeing things. However, last night we both saw something that we cannot explain. We were both sitting on the couch in the dim living room sometime around 9.30 p.m. She was sitting to my left playing a game on my laptop, and I was watching her play. Suddenly, in the right side of my peripheral vision, I saw a large black shadow moving from left to right beside the couch. 
I say shadow, but it was opaque and completely black. It was about the size of a person, but it had no features. I look over to her, and she has a shocked look on her face, staring at the same spot where I was seeing the shadow. She said that she noticed something moving, looked up, and directly saw a white opaque cloth moving from left to right. She said it was floating out from the wall in midair, and disappeared as she was staring directly at it. She described it as having folds very similar to what I saw about a week prior. What really freaks me out is that we did not say a word to each other before locking eyes in horror. We independently saw something at the exact same instant. However, they were polar opposites. I saw a voluminous, dark shadow, and she saw a white cloth, both moving in the same place from left to right. I can't explain any of this, but we were both pretty scared from it. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm and that's incredibly helpful to the channel. If you're new to the channel, why not join us? Be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode. I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. If you're listening to this on iTunes or another podcast platform, please give this a 5-star rating as it's incredibly helpful to us over there. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share a story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Many thanks to my friend, J Nightmares, who helped me read two of the stories tonight. If you enjoy their voice and are interested in Japanese horror stories translated to English, definitely check out their channel. You can find the link to do so in the description down below. If you're on the go and don't have YouTube Premium but want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you guys would like to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button, subscribing, and maybe giving us a 5 star rating on iTunes, maybe check out the merch store. I've got t-shirts, hoodies, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Don't forget to join me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.